Thanks a lot, uh, Thomas. Jay White is a friend, but he asked me something very difficult because of the, the issue we are discussing here is not so easy. Somehow, when I started with enthusiasm working on this, I said, oh, my friend, <laughs> what a friend with this friend. <laughs> Why I need enemies? No, uh, it's a joke. Also, I think that um, the program is terrific. So um, maybe what I'm going to say can be compared with uh, and uh, complemented by other lectures here. Um, I want, I would try to show um, a path into this issue, into this question, through three main steps. First of all, an historical one, because I, <clears throat> I follow somehow resource man. So I think that it's very important to, to look back and to understand why the fathers, the theologians in the Middle Ages, uh, develop some tools and use them and so on. Then we, we can go to the, the last century where um, everything exploded somehow, where when this question became a key one. And then we will enter the, from a dogmatical point of view into, into the question itself. Everything will be introduced by a couple of tools that I want to share with you because I think that they're very interesting and effective in my perspective and concluded by some challenges that I see. About bibliography, I've divided it into two groups. First of all, first of all what happened with some uh, important books uh, which are there and are very interesting, com complex, uh, interesting, but meaningful in any case. And then a second part on, of the bibliography with books ca that can help to read what happened somehow. In a nutshell, a couple of articles are very useful by Journet and Marco Salvioli. I would say that these articles are uh, are in, useful uh, to read to understand what happened. So first of all, uh, this couple of, uh, of tools, um, I'm obsessed with uh, Mind the Gap. When you are in London in the tube, you hear this. Um, and I think that from the um, metaphysical point of view, Mind the Gap is very important. <laughs> and um, because in the Greek metaphysical perspective, God and the world are connected in a necessary way, both are finite and both are eternal. So the picture is quite different from what we have in the, from the Christian perspective. Because we, if we move to the patristic picture that they had to develop, taking their distance from this previous picture, we have two different metaphysical dimensions: the divine one, uh, which is eternal and infinite, and the created one, uh, the world that is finite and temporal. So in between, we have a, a gulf, a, a gap, an ontological ocean somehow. And this is very important because <clears throat> when we look at what happened, we have to take, in, to, to take seriously this difference, in, in my opinion. Also in the news, uh, I read uh, recently that uh, Margaret McCallum, uh, was the wife of Oswald Lawrence, uh, I didn't know who he was, uh, who was the actor who read Mind the Gap and was recorded for the London Tube. But she's, she became a, a widow. And uh, when uh, Oswald, his husband, passed away, she used to go to the Tube to hear his husband's voice recorded. Oh. <laughs> and then they changed the voice. <laughs> In, uh, in 2012, they changed with the uh, automatic voice and she complained. And just in the Northern Line in, at, at the station close to her house, they put again the, the real one, the, <laughs> the husband's voice. So Mind the Gap is something very personal, human, tender, related to, to love. This is the first, tom, this, the first tool. The second one is the difference between semantics and syntax. When we read a, <clears throat> uh, a note, um, it does correspond to a real sound with uh, some fixed frequencies, 440, for example, for an A. And this correspondence is a semantic one. There is a sign which points to 
a real thing. On the contrary, when we have a song, we can change the pitch so we can change the notes, but uh, <clears throat> the, the melody is the same. Because when we hear a song, we have a syntactic dimension too, the correspondences between, uh, between the notes. And so in reality, we have both when we speak in grammar, in our language, in our approach to reality, we need both semantics and syntax. For example, when, when, we, th when the, we see the Union Jack, it's a sign that points to the UK. When we hear God save the Queen, it's some sort of syntax that pointing to the, the UK itself. So when we use these uh, tools, when we combine these tools, we can see that uh, <clears throat> the Greek view, both Plato's one and Aristotle's one, is more semantic because of idealism. So the real being is uh, something that, that is intellectual, an intellectual form that is within reality, in the case of Aristotle, an idea that is beyond reality in Plato's case. But uh, <clears throat> classic metaphysics is more semantic. On the contrary, when we move to the Christian picture, this gap, in, this gap implies that we need a syntax that we need relations, we need to combine. Our God is triune, and because of that, reality is made of relations. And this is something that can be uh, kept in mind um, to, to face this issue and to understand what happened in, uh, the, in the first centuries. First of all, um, both uh, philosophy and religions have to do with salvation. Salvation is not, not something just related to, uh, to religions, but also metaphysics was developed, it was developed to find the real being, the ultimate cause. And this first principle is the end. So this research was meant to discover the way to live fully, to live well. And because of that, uh, the point is not salvation. But when we go to the question about religions and even metaphysics or philosophy, the question is what salvation? What sort of salvation? We have, uh, for example, the Homeric version of salvation in ancient Greece, where doxa, so the, the opinion, uh, the fame, was the way to survive to death. On the contrary, we have the metaphysical approach where we have a, a I call it a universal that is in the sense of the category. So you, you don't have a personal salvation, but a generic salvation. You can be saved, let's think to the Dianima in the Aristotle case and the criticism on him, because uh, there is just one soul that is forever, but the personal souls is underestimated somehow, at least uh, in Alexander of Aphrodisia and the readings uh, um, that were important for the fathers of the church. Because of that, they, um, they talked very badly of Aristotle in some cases. They were Aristotelian because Neoplatonism was, had many elements of Aristotelism, but at the same time, they were not fond of Aristotle. And then we have the Christian uh, sort of salvation that is personal. Also, um, for example, providence uh, in the Christian perspective is personal. On the contrary, According to Aristotle, the Stoic, there is no personal providence. There is also general providence. But at the same time, <clears throat> in uh, classical metaphysics, we find a lot of discussions about salvation. Let's think about the Eutrypho by Plato or the Symposius by Plato. And so um, Plato and Aristotle used the myths purify the concept uh, of salvation that was typical of the, of the ancient uh, Greek culture and develop it. And again, we have uh, mm, some distinction between religion and philosophy, but we cannot say that uh, there is an opposition. Both are talking about salvation. And when we move uh, into Revelation uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, we have a, an interesting tension 
because we have a coincidence between Jesus and the Creator, combining the Old Testament and the New Testament as in Monreale is done in Italy, in, in Sicily. You can see this mosaic, who are, which are wonderful. And uh, you can see that uh, the face of the Creator is the face of the Pantrocatro, is Jesus himself. So <clears throat> we have a tension here because God is choosing one people. There is a, a division between the Jewish people and the other peoples. But at the same time, uh, God is the creator. So it's the creator of all the human beings in the world. And still, <clears throat> the question is, how is this salvation um, spreading to everybody? You should become a, a Jew to be saved or not. And uh, <clears throat> this tension is solved, as we know, just in, uh, in, in the New Testament. But what I want to stress with this uh, historical part is that the tension between uh, the salvation of, uh, in religion, the salvation of some um, part of humanity and the salvation of everybody is always present, both in the, in the philosophical approach and in uh, the, the Christian and Jewish approach. What we see <clears throat> is that this very connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between Jesus and the Creator, brought <clears throat> some um, uh, scholars whom I appreciate a lot, for example, Christian Milka and Remy Brack, to um, study the method of the fathers of the church, the method of the philosophers that was, we can call, call it in Greek, chresis, according to Christian Nilka, Nilka's uh, um, reading. So the use, Plato used, had recourse to the myths of uh, Greek religion. The Bible had combined the Old Testament and the New Testament, and in the New Testament, they are using the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament itself, they are combining different layers of the, of the oral traditions. And so we have a, an hypertext somehow in the Bible. And then we have the fathers of the church who used uh, both the metaphysical element and the biblical uh, element to get a new picture. So what I'm trying to stress here is that the father are inclusive. They always work uh, joining things, not dividing things. They are syntactic, not just semantics, because the meaning of something is related to the context. The meaning of, of a text comes from the relationship between the text and the context. For example, if I say now gift, I'm using an English word that is present in English. But if I, I, were, speak, uh, if I were speaking in German, the very word gift in German is venom. So it depends on the context. To get the meaning, we need, we need the context. And the father, because of that, used the elements of the, the religious elements, metaphysical elements, into their picture. Uh, one of the most important was Justin, who talked about the semina verbi, the seeds of uh, the word. And uh, that is a key element for what we are discussing here. What are these semina verbi? Uh, what is this uh, word? Is Jesus, um, is the second person of the Trinity, uh, is truth in general? Because the father knew, Justin was a philosopher, that something wonderful was already, already present in the human thought. And they wanted to stress that these, those elements were Christian somehow, were human and because of that Christian had to do with God. And because of that, they always tried to keep everything together, stressing the differences, but at the same time joining through the differences. Uh, Tertullian, Tertullian spoke about the anima naturaliter Christiana. So the human being is looking for Christ. And uh, mm, there were learned uh, men who understood many things uh, of the pagan culture. Eusebius, one of the most powerful collector of, uh, you know, of truth, uh, spoke about preparatio evangelica. All of these are different solutions 
to the problem of the difference in continuity between what uh, um, the human being found before Christ and what we have through Revelation. Augustine spoke about Ecclesia ab Abael. So the Ecclesia started with the first human being, but you already know many things about that after the first talk, I think, and you will, will uh, learn more later. But there is something, because Augustine is accused to be a very strict, to stress too much sin and the original sin. At the same time, he speaks about Ecclesia of Abel. So we should combine, we should balance every sentence of the fathers uh, with the context, with the whole picture of their thought. Cyprian of Carthage is uh, <clears throat> maybe uh, one of the most important fathers for the issue because he uh, wrote uh, Salus Extra Ecclesia Non Est. That is the origin of Extra Ecclesia Nulla Salus. That is the, the key sentence in this discussion. And also, uh, to understand that, we should go back to the context again of Salus Extra Ecclesia Non Est, because he wrote that in a letter to Pope Stephen I, uh, about the Donatists, and uh, Cyprian was writing against the Pope, against the Pope's position, who was inclusive. So this Salus Extra Ecclesia Non Est comes from a complex context. And even Fulgentius, who wrote Extra Ecclesia Nulla Salum, Salus, was uh, working in the Gostin uh, tradition, but was somehow pushing uh, the ideas of Augustine in a, in a direction that was too strict uh, with, if compared with the full picture. Even more complex is if, is if we go to the Greek tradition, the Greek fathers, because in that case, uh, we have, for example, universal salvation, Gregory of Nyssa is clearly teaching apocatastasis, at the same time, his apocatastasis is not what we think. It's not what origin taught, for example. It's not that there is no hell, but is that we should go back to a dynamical state that was um, the one we were created in. And because of that, uh, we could translate uh, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, at least in uh, Maximus' interpretation, as extra humanitate nulla salus. So if you uh, refuse Christ, you are refusing to be human somehow. And Gregory of Nyssa <clears throat> speaks uh, of becoming like a dog, for example, but it's very tough. It's not so polite in his uh, in interpretation, but we could say that from the ontological perspective, they have a clear uh, see, sight on the coincidence between being human and being Christian because everything was created in Christ somehow, for Christ. One, uh, so for my patristical perspective, we are working between these two sentences, between, between extra ecclesia nulla salus and extra humanitate nulla salus. And the interpretation of these two sentences is what we are working on here today somehow. But I want to share with you one of the patristic text that I love most, uh, that is by Ambrose. Uh, I was born in, uh, in the Diocese of Milan because of that I'm used to, to read Ambrose as much as I can. And in commenting on uh, the Exameron, he speaks of the creation of the human being on the sixth day, sixth day, yeah. And he links this sixth day with the Good Friday when Jesus died. And he explains that uh, God rested only after create the creation of the human being, because he, in that moment, had someone to forgive. And this is wonderful, because he connects the death of Christ on the cross with this forgiveness of our sins. And we can see from this perspective that forg forgiveness is within creation itself, is the end of creation itself. So, Mercy is not something added from without. It's something that is the foundation is within, is the foundation of our, our creation of our world. 
And from this perspective, we can see how syntactic the father's approach is. They are not discussing in a um, judicial way. They're not seeing things from an external law, but they're always thinking from an internal law. That is uh, the very law of being. But from this, tensions come, as, as we know. This is the quicunque, symbol of Satanasianus, that has nothing to do with Athanasius, but uh, it's more Augustinian somehow. It, it comes from France in the fifth century, more, most probably. And uh, the beginning, quicunque vult salvus est, and the omnia opus est, uteniat catholicam fidem, quam nisi quisque integram in violatanque servabi, absque dubio in eternum peridit. So the sentence is quite clear and quite tough. <laughs> and so how, what is happening here? Extra Ecclesia nulla salus becomes also part of the dogma in the first Lateran Council and at Florence. But just as in the Quicunque, in the symbol of Satanasianus, this sentence is always aimed at Christians who are living the communion with the church. And so the ancient context of uh, extra ecclesia nulla salu is ad intra, not ad extra. And this is very important because if we try to apply it to uh, pagan religions, we should be very uh, attentive because it's not the same. It's not what the fathers were saying. It's what, not what Magisterium was saying. And because of that, if Congar talk about his misleading clear axiom about the extra ecclesia nulla salus, this is a wonderful formula in my opinion. In Middle Ages, because of that, and the Middle Ages was a, a, were a monotheistic time because there were no, um, America wasn't discovered yet. And because of that, uh, all people were Muslim, Jewish or Christian. No, place for other people there. And because of that, uh, this connection between God and the world was uh, presented according to two main uh, uh, pictures. The, the first of all is the gap that I already uh, highlighted. But in the Fransc Franciscan tradition, and uh, bonum diffusivum sui was very, very important because they stress more the connection between the goodness of the first principle that is a source, not just something good in itself, but something good that is welling goodness uh, and the world that is good because it receives this goodness. So this is oversimplified, but we could say that the Dominicans stress more the gap. I don't want to say that this here, but this is my reading, I beg your pardon if it's not like that. And the Franciscan schools stress more bonum diffusivum suri. So they were trying to combine two different elements of this tension. But the tension is there because the tensions come from this syntactic element that was present in patristic reading. This is the cathedral of my town where I was born in Como. And uh, I'm showing that to you because the tourist office gives money to me. No, it's not, not like this, but because it's a wonderful example, I think, of what uh, the Middle Ages produced. Because on the facade of this church, uh, whose dimension could uh, uh, were so wide to that the people of the town could be there. So all the people, all the inhabitants of Como could stay in the church when the church was built. But at the main entrance, you can see two statues of two um, characters. When you look at them, you think that they're, you could think that there are some sense, but there are, there are two pagan, and the pagans, the first one, Pliny the younger, the, the other one, Pliny the older, the elder, both born in Como. And uh, it's wonderful. Try to imagine a new church in Rome or whatever with oaking on the facade. This is shocking for us. But this is very important because they understood that this resist, this use of the elements of truth was kept, was part of, of Christianity. 
to make a full picture of everything. And I would, would say that mm, this harmonic picture uh, was uh, shocked somehow uh, by two elements. The first one came from Germany, Luther, and the second, second one came from Italy, Columbus. It's discussed if Columbus was Italian or not, but we don't have cancel culture here. We want to stress that Columbus was, was Italian. Also, <laughs> if, if you let's think about convincing the Queen of Spain to find something that you didn't find, but you find something, something else by mistake, and it was incredible. And, those, and moreover, the, those, that of exchanging gold with glass is something typical Italian. So there is something Italian there, I would say. But <clears throat> what, what happened with the Reformation and uh, with the discovery of uh, the Americas? That uh, mm, suddenly the human being discovered that there were a lot of people, a lot of human beings who were not Catholic, Jewish, or Muslim. And a uh, big question arose in that moment. And they were not prepared to, to answer those questions. And also Reformation put divisions into uh, the Catholic Church itself. So we could say that uh, from unity, we moved to differences, we, to clashes. We have wars for religion in Europe. And that caused a sort of, uh, I call it diaphora, diaphoraphobia. That means, sorry, <clears throat> the, the fear of differences that is typical in postmodernity. The idea is that religion brings conflicts and differences are dangerous. So we should move into identity because if we are in identity, we are safe. But this doesn't work uh, very well, as we see in the, in the, in the last century, where <clears throat> globalization uh, got to an incredible degree, because we, mm, we can see, for example, the flights to Rome that cover all the world before COVID, before Corona, they cover all the, all the world. Now it's more expensive, the complex to, to, uh, to travel, but and if we look at all the flights in the world, we can see how they cover the world itself somehow. So in this way, we can uh, know different religions, different cultures, and we are exposed to many differences. And we need a thought that is able to cope with these differences. And this started at the end of the 19th century the answer to this uh, problem of differences started uh, in uh, the ecumenical context because the ecumenical movement was started in, uh, in the missions where different um, missionaries met an evangelical one and the Catholic one were announcing Christ, the one God to pagan people. And that didn't work because how can you announce uh, the God is one when you are divided. So differences became a problem there. And because of that, the first step was, okay, let's work to bring the churches back to unity because otherwise we cannot wit witness to our God, to the, our triune God, a God who is in itself one and uh, somehow has differences, but relational differences, not uh, uh, dialectical differences. Because of that, they got back to the sources. Let's go together to read the fathers and the patristic movements, the biblical movement and the liturgical movement came out of this experience of differences. So uh, in this context, uh, mm, some work was done, some very interesting work was done in my opinion to, uh, to answer the tensions between universal salvation and mm, the Catholic faith. How can we combine this unity? Um, <clears throat> I think that the most effective way of seeing what happened is to go to Runner and Balthazar. You will hear more about the Lubac and so on, so you, 
you will uh, <clears throat> learn more and discuss more. But in my opinion, the case of Runner and Balthasar is very interesting because both um, taught universal salvation. So Runner was very open, as we know, anonymous Christians and so on. But Balthasar wasn't a strict um, Roman theologian who thought that hell does exist and that a lot of people will be there. So somehow um, both um, had readings there the, which denied the extra ecclesia nulla salus, because according to Balthasar, there was hope that hell was empty, as we know. But what I like is to stress the difference in their approaches, because Runner was more philosophical and follow more reason. On the other side, Balthasar <clears throat> stressed more desire and beauty, the static dimension. Uh, Runner worked with the method of immanence, was Kantans, Kantian somehow, and uh, Balthasar were more historical. From his perspective, the drama of uh, the human freedom was the key element of everything. Uh, Runner wanted to make explicit what is implicit, and he stresses the, the, the importance of, uh, of proving that it's possible to get to know God. On the contrary, Balthasar stressed more the, the relationship between the fragment and the whole. And maybe I'm biased in reading these two theologians because I like a lot of the syntactic elements. So I'm closer to, uh, to Balthasar because Runner, being an idealist somehow, is more semantic huh, in, in my reading. Um, also, Runner was very important in, uh, in the Second Vatican Council. He was the theological expert of Cardinal Koenig of Vienna. Uh, otherwise, Balthasar, was more important somehow for the post um, after the council, also the two reviews, Concilium and Comunio, uh, are there to, to witness to these differences. So I'm stressing the differences. I know they are closer somehow. I starting from the uh, from affirming that both uh, are followers of universal salvation. So I I'm not stressing the difference between I think that are one against the other, but I think that it's very important to look how those two authors um, somehow spurred a new thought about the church. They highlighted that uh, our ecclesiology was imperfect, was insufficient, because it was de developed in the Middle Ages, when uh, the idea of perfect, perfect society was also related to the empire, to the identity between being a citizen and being Christian. But uh, through the discovery of America, the Lutheran uh, Reformation and so on, that romantic picture came down. And so one first attempt was more syntactic that, that is the mystical body. But uh, going back to the, the fathers through resource man, uh, Ratzinger is a perfect example of this. Uh, the ecclesiology developed the concept of people of God that is uh, the most syntactic of all, I would say. It's important to stress that these understandings of the church are somehow pericoretic. So it's not a dialectical process where the body uh, overcomes uh, the society and so on, but uh, they're one in the other, as in pericolis, I would say that this is, the, this is the law of theology. But through this idea of people, uh, spaces open, why spaces open, also to new experiences, because, <clears throat> for example, we had people who could travel and also people who, theologians and monks, who could share the experience, uh, for example, in India, in Asia in general. Here we have the Ashram Satchidananda, where Bede Griffiths uh, was, and Panikar, the Pui, spent some time. <clears throat> so, as you can see from this very picture, there, there was a connection between Hinduism and Christianity and the Trinity. <clears throat> so, these experiences <clears throat> were related also to the Second Vatican, Vatican Council, um, that taught in a very clear way that the Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions, in the pagan religions, as we said before. This is from Nostra Etate. 
And in Gaudium Express um, 22, maybe we have the clearest point, also the theological and dogmatic explanation of this sentence. The truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate world does the mystery of man take on light. For his, by his incarnation, the Son of God has united himself in some fashion with every human being, every man. And this holds true not only for Christians, but for all men of goodwill and so on. So we can see that uh, uh, there is something uh, very good in all the religions around the world. Everything <clears throat> uh, was developed by St. John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger, as we know, because uh, John Paul II went to Assisi in uh, <clears throat> 1986. And uh, after that, he had a meeting with uh, leaders, religious leaders from all over the world. And after that, he published Le Redemptoris Missio, uh, the encyclica, where also uh, is affirmed the importance of religions, but uh, with some, uh, there is something, there is some caveats also. But one of the most serious reasons for the lack of interest in the missionary task task is a widespread indifferentism, which said to say is found also among Christian. It's based on an incorrect theological perspective and it's, it's characterized by religious relativ relativism, which leads to the belief that one religion is as good as another. So we can see that this openness to other religions can be just semantic and not syntactic. So it could be, okay, one is good as another, they are the same. There is a different sign of the same reality. This is a semantic approach. On the contrary, what Remtoris Missio is teaching is that uh, according to the Second Vatican Council, we should be open to relations, relationships with all other religions because every human means connected to Jesus somehow. But this is syntactic, not just semantic. Because of that, in 2000, Dominus Jesu came, was published by, as we know, the um, doctrine of the faith, where the position, position again, relativism is quite tough and clear. Also, as we know, Ratzinger didn't attend the first meeting in Assisi because he was preoccupied about relativism, but he attended the second one in 1993. And it was supposed also to happen in 2002, but uh, uh, the, twins, uh, the Twin Towers uh, was there and was just, hap just happened and so everything was uh, cancelled. But uh, Pope Benedict attended another meeting in 2011. So we get to the core of the question. Uh, is the church just a high occupation vehicle that has a special lane as some, in some places in the world. In California, I discovered this, and in Italy, in Rome, you can imagine that we don't have something like that. Um, we have high occupation streets and not lanes uh, and vehicles. But <clears throat> what is the church? Is a special path for some people? Uh, what is that? Is another possibility between many of them so maybe in Dominus Jesus 14, we have the dogmatic core of everything. The Second Vatican Council, in fact, has stated that. So the idea is interpreting the council. The unique mediation of the Redeemer does not exclude, but rather give rise to a manifold cooperation, with the, which is but a participation in this one source. This is Lumen and Gentium. The content of this participated mediation should be explored more deeply. So, Theological work should be done. We, we don't have a real solution, a clear answer, but we know <clears throat> that this is the framework and we should research more, but must remain always consistent with the principle of Christ's unique mediation. And <clears throat> Redentoris Missio is quoting here, although participated forms of mediation of different kinds and degrees are not excluded, they acquire meaning and value only from Christ's own mediation. And they cannot be understood as parallel of com or complementary to his. So this is the point in, from my perspective. <clears throat> Other um, quotations from Dominus Jesus says the same and <clears throat> stress that uh, this mediation of Christ is 
unique and singular, uh, exclusive, universal, absolute. So these uh, adjectives are, are very important. So in this picture, I synthesize my view of the issue. We have semina verbi uh, in the father's teaching, and uh, they were referred to philosophy, not to religions. This is very important. After the Middle Ages, we applied semina verba also to religions. In doing that, something changed because the text was put in another context. And because of that, we moved from the idea that the one Christ, the, who is the Logos, spread his truth in different places, to the idea that uh, Christ is one seed among the other seeds. So, according to Magisterium, we cannot accept uh, the second picture. We cannot accept this understanding of semina verbi because it's, it is not Catholic in the sense of tradition, not denominational Catholicism, but it's not Catholic according to the democracy of the dead, as Chatterton says, uh, wrote. Visually, we have, uh, for example, San Clemente in Rome, where we have uh, the tree of life. So Christ, and the cross of Christ is the tree from which life uh, is spread to everybody. On the contrary, we have the forest with many different trees. Magisteriums, uh, the teachings of the church, of the Catholic church, stresses, stress a lot the first picture, the tree of life. And because of that, we should keep these dogmatic principles that come from the scripture. Man needs to be saved because we are finite, but we long for eternity. We, we long for the infinity. This is the, the cross of every human being that we should bear. <laughs> the Savior is unique and God wants to save everyone. So this is the, the mark, the framework that uh, we should keep. Conclusions. Esther Ecclesia Nulla Salo was read from three different perspectives. Inclusion, as Runner did. Exclusion, as Bart from the Evangelical side uh, did and Bart would Bart and, and Balthazar were very close because they were stressing uh, this syntactic element. As we say, the gap was very present in their approach. And the pluralistic view, I had no time to speak about John Hick and Paul Knichter, Knichter one from on the Anglican and the other one on the Catholic side. But now we are facing uh, broader uh, problems. Is football a religion? There is an afterlife in internet. Uh, if you watch uh, uh, Black Mirror, for example, the Black Mirror series, you can see that um, in postmodernity, we have big questions that theologians in the last century couldn't even imagine, I would say. So we need to keep to these elements with different <clears throat> issues, with different outcomes. For example, David Bentley Hart, uh, published this interesting book. I don't share his view, but the book is very interesting. That all should be saved. He follows uh, universal salvation, but he keeps the idea that this universal salvation is through Christ, is through the church, the one church of Christ. Possible solutions of the problem, denying the principle as Rainer Kung and Dupuy did, Dupuy was rector in a, was in a Gregorian University and there were problems around the year 2000. But my problem with this solution, uh, this reading of Extra Ecclesia Nulla Salus, is that uh, it's not traditional somehow, there is a break. Then a social reading as the Lubac did, uh, Resource Human and the Father went in that direction. And uh, a third one is a relational uh, reading of this, where somehow we see that uh, every human being is syntactically connected with the other, with the other. So as in um, Dialogue de Carmelitain, we can see that one human being can suffer the fear for the death of the number one. So we are connected. Maybe the good death, theft uh, was saved uh, from the perspective in the place of John, we could say, because he was not sent, but he was saved. So our challenges are the real problem is not the salvation of the non-believers. In my opinion, my real, my real problem is my salvation. I'm a believer, but how is it possible? This is the real question. We should look at extra ecclesia from this perspective. 
Then, from the domatic point of view, the two divine missions cannot be divided, and immanence cannot be uh, ex immanence and economy should be kept together without being confused. This is something very important. Julien Marie stressed stresses a lot this point, and I agree with him. And then Trinitarian ontology, that is something very interesting developed now. That could be shocking if you think of that without Christology, but we should keep together Trinitarian ontology and Christology. There is no other way to the Trinity but Christ. So maybe we are ready for a relational holiness, a new definition of, of sanctity that is not just uh, semantic, so you have these virtues, you do correspond with the model, but it is relational as the good theft did, as the only innocent did. So my proposal is to look at the semina verbi uh, from a relational understanding of logos, from a syntactic perspective, and to look at the church from a relational identity. So to be a human being means to be connected to all the other human beings. You are not yourself alone by yourself, not just in the church, but in mankind, and I would say even in history. I beg your pardon if I spoke a little bit more. Thanks a lot. <laughs>